the way to go with stiffness. <laughs> um, yeah. That's that's a that's a loaded question. Oh, sorry. Um. So let me put it to you this. No, no, we all, we all, we can discuss this. Come on. <laughs> um, so let me say this because I've got, I've gotten in, um, we'll call them heated conversations with people over stretching. Yes. Stretching has its place. So, you know, your, your typical, you know, 20, 30 second holds of a static position, it, it has its, its time and its place, right? If, if I feel stiff on a day and, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, about to do, like, I'm going to the gym and I want to do some chest press and, you know, okay, you can do a little bit of static stretching to kind of open up space. But what I think people are fooled on is thinking that static stretching is a way to gain more range of motion because it, it doesn't help with that at all. What you're actually doing with that is you're just actually tricking your body into giving you the range that you already had. So your range of motion, so your flexibility is controlled by your stretch reflex. And so if you go into a stretch and you hold, let's say, a, a pec stretch for 30 seconds, you'll realize that at the end, you feel like there's more stretch. Hey guys, welcome to the 29th episode with Coach Ola. Today's guest is Adam Youngsma, and we talked about amazing stuff. We'll have an introduction coming up. But before we get started, I would like to remind you that we are in the 10 days of Dil Hijjah. And inshallah, on Saturday, August 10th, will be the 9th day of Dil Hijjah, which is the last month in the Islamic calendar. And as we know, that day of Arafah is one of those blessed days in our calendar, in our religion, our faith. And I want to remind my Muslim listeners who are listening and for the non-Muslims to learn more about our faith that on this day, it's recommended to fast from the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam because fasting on this day, inshallah, will absolve the sins for two years, the previous year and come and the coming year and the fasting on Ashura, the 10th day of Muharram, atones for the sins of the previous year and that is by Al-Bukhari and Al-Tirmidhi. And this is, for me, it's a reminder that, of course, we're, con we're always going to continue making sense. But that doesn't mean that just because the previous years have been erased or forgiven, for example, we are constantly have to work on our self-development, personal development, what have you. So it's just a, a little interesting reminder that's brought back to our faith. And since, inshallah, Sunday will be Hajj, right? It's a, this episode is a great reminder on how it is important for us, the Muslims, especially when it comes to days and times such as Hajj, Umrah, prayers, what have you, that we really need to keep up with our movement. And in this episode, we talked about and emphasized on what is actually movement in comparison to what is fitness. These two are not exactly the same. And Adam did a really amazing job in explaining with his expertise and, of course, I shared my own experience as a person trainer with clients on stiffness, stretching, and all that fun stuff. So let's get ready and get started. Welcome to the Purposeful Fitness with Coach Ola, where I dive in deeper into holistic health and fitness topics that would help you stay inspired, motivated, and dedicated to living a purposeful fit life while pursuing for the Akhirah. Hey, welcome everyone. Today we have Adam Youngsma. He is the founder and CEO of Kinetic Reformist Movement Education. Working as a clinical kinesiologist and strength and conditioning coach, Adam has worked with professional athletes from the NHL, NFL, CFL, SPL and various amateur athletes and teams from the NCEAA, CIS, and local grassroots organizations. His education and experience have allowed him to become a highly regarded leader in the movement education and personal trainer development field, having presented courses and conference sessions across North America. Adam believes training and rehabilitation should be evidence-based and experience-led, so his mission is to empower other fitness and allied health professionals to optimize movements and longevity 
by bridging the gap between research and practical application. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the differences between mobility, stability, and stiffness, and how it's all related to our spinal stability. We're going to talk about three areas that we should focus on to improve our spinal instability, and how and why it's important to add asymmetrical loading to our workouts, and much more. Before we get started, I just want to mention that I met Adam at one of the sessions at my Idea East conference this past March, so it was really nice to have him on. So let's get ready and welcome Adam. How are you, Adam, today? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Fine. Fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Would you please tell us about yourself and what you currently do? Yeah. So as you mentioned, I run a, a movement education company out of Toronto, Canada. And basically, that's what I do. So I teach. We've come up with a pain to performance series, which are two courses leading into now three, which is one of the things we're currently working on. But uh, they basically focus on bridging the gap between rehabilitation and personal training, but not only used um, for rehab. Um, all the all the assessments, all the information that you learn is actually applicable to clients of any level from the general population, injured clients, all the way up to high level athletes. That's awesome. And how did the whole kinetic performance movement education come about? So that's, uh, that's an interesting story. So when I, when I came out of university, I started working in clinics as a kinesiologist and I actually had an end goal of becoming a physiotherapist. And I was like, yeah, I want to be a physiotherapist. I want to work with maybe some professional teams. But within the first, I don't know, three or four months of working there, I, I realized that I, I really didn't want to be a physio. And the, re the reason for that is, is because uh, like my personality, I'm very, I'm very, um, very straightforward. I'm very blunt when I say things and I'm very matter of fact. And so working with clients who really uh, a lot of times didn't actually care about improving themselves or wouldn't go home and do the homework that you've given them because maybe you only see them once a week. I didn't, I didn't like that. And I didn't like having to try to feel like I was forcing people to do things, which is kind of what led me into the fitness industry. And so I worked as a strength and conditioning coach for many, many years, uh, you know, personal trainer. I managed a couple facilities. And what I realized is that most clients, when they come in to see a personal trainer, are there because they they actually want to be there, not because they're being forced to be there. Even though you still have, with a lot of clients, you have the you know the changes in motivation from time to time. I found it a bit easier to kind of guide them into that. But during those probably three or four years where I was managing a couple of facilities, I also noticed that there was a there was a need for increased levels of education, specifically surrounding what to do with a client when they do have some sort of pain. Because what we're told in our personal training certifications is, you know, refer out. As soon as you have somebody report pain to you, you refer out. And well, that's, you know, always a safe option. And, you know, there are some trainers, if they don't have any background, that's probably the best option. But what we try to do is kind of like blend through that and so I started designing education and I realized that I enjoyed the actual teaching side of things more than the actual training side of things. And so, yeah, I started to develop and run a few courses, taught at a couple post-secondary institutions up here in Toronto. And then, yeah, it's just kind of unfolded from there over the past three years or so. That's so inspiring. And I completely can relate because it's so true as another personal trainer and a functional fitness specialist. My next professional goal is to really become a strength conditioning coach because it does make a huge difference. And a there is a difference between strength conditioning coach certification and corrective exercise. And I feel as a trainer, I really need to become more aware and increase my knowledge on how to correct exercises rather than just keep doing the same thing or repetitive movements that are not really helpful for the body. And as you said, there are so many clients who, when you tell them, like, slow it down, there's a few things that need to be worked on. They're very impatient because they want to see the results, like, right away. And I definitely want to add courses. And, like, that's something I enjoy as well as um, teaching. So whoever's listening and they're in the fitness field, there's so many options in our industry. So thank you. Would you then please explain to our listeners the difference between mobility, stability, and stiffness? And how is that related to our spinal stability? Yeah, so let's um let's let's start with mobility first. 
so mobility is basically this idea of being able to move yourself through a range of motion. So I consider mobility to be an active movement. Now, mobility in and of itself is made up of two things. It's made up of your flexibility, so the ability for your joints to move through a range of motion, and then it's also made up of stability. And so the idea is this. You could have somebody passively stretch you probably further than you could actually lift that limb yourself. And that's because your body allows you to have certain amounts of flexibility around a joint. But if there's not stability within that range of motion, then your body won't be able to control it. And so therefore you won't have that full range of mobility. And that's why there's the difference between active and passive range of motion. And so oftentimes when we look at mobility, we're looking at the joint itself because the joint itself has a lot to do with the actual ability of that, you know, limb to move through a full range of motion. And when we look at flexibility, oftentimes we're looking at the soft tissue. So we're looking at things like, you know, muscle tendon, fascial uh, restrictions there. When it comes to stiffness, stiffness is often what we pass as being stability but stiffness in like in and of itself is is a static position so when we think of um, you know a joint being stiff or muscles being stiff or just waking up and feeling stiff it's it's a lack of movement it's a lack of i guess kind of range in the joints in the muscles in the fascia and so often people think well if something's not moving then it's stable and it's got stability but stiffness isn't isn't stability and it shouldn't be thought of as that because people can develop stiffness for any number of reasons everything from overtraining or excessive physical labor to poor nutrition poor hydration to injuries and trauma there's a lot of reasons why people can develop stiffness but one of the things that we teach is we actually go through, we've got like this adapt training system that we run people through in our courses. And the idea is one of the biggest things in there is addressing the range of motion and then looking to add stability on top of that before we start getting people into or reintegrating those tissues or those limbs back into movement again. And how is that then related to the spinal stability? Because I know everything comes from the core and the spine, all of it. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there's, there's a now, I guess, famous saying by Stuart McGill, who said, you can't fire a cannon from a canoe. So the idea being that if you don't have a firm foundation, then nothing else that you do is going to be, you're not going to be able to express power in sports or in lifting. And you're really going to have what we call like these, these force leaks through the system. And so what we want is we want, we want a spine or a spinal stabilization system that's that's mobile. So I want it to be able to move through its full range of motion, but I also want it to be resilient and adaptable as well. So I want it to actually be able to create, you know, stability in one position. And I want to be able to then express movement elsewhere from that. And so what you often find is that, and I actually had a conversation with somebody this morning about this, is that you often see like most of the, certifications that you can get they focus so much on the the foundational lifts on the you know programming the progressing of movements all that kind of stuff but rarely do they ever actually look at the spinal stabilization system or the exercises how to program those four specific types of clients and then how to progress those later on and i think that's a real big miss in the fitness industry in general is that people then don't know, right? So they're just doing, you know, they're holding planks for a minute, two minutes. They're doing seated Russian twists and leg raises and, you know, those kneeling machines where you rotate your lower body. And every single time I see most of those movements, like I'm cringing while seeing them because I know the damage that it's doing, but it's just a lack of education, right? It's like, if you just don't know better than, then you do, you do anything. And so when we're looking at spinal stability, we're looking at creating mobility and resiliency and so therefore stability in the spine to allow then for you know better lifting mechanics and therefore more strength and power output and also when we're then looking at getting it into functional movements or sport specific movements 
that's where you start to see increases in velocity and in, in pitching or you know shooting in hockey or swinging a baseball bat or a golf club and you start to see more of that as well as obviously the injury resistance that you get from that as well that's so true especially like this morning so first of all the cringing part yes i can totally relate and this morning i for example i had a client who was doing a plank and then we did the wood chops right and with the wood chop she felt some back pain and i was like you know what i'm gonna ask yeah. adam today because i'm gonna go like research about it because there shouldn't be back pain when we're doing wood chops it's supposed to work the core so actually would you mind like telling us right now about how to avoid the back pain when we're doing like wood chops because it, it shouldn't be there yeah, so wood chops are an interesting thing. Like I, I consider wood chops to be kind of a more progressive exercise, right? So mm -hmm. wood chops are require a lot of dynamic movement, a lot of coordination. And, you know, if you're coming up and over top, so if you're doing that, you know, coming from, you know, if we're chopping up or down, like it doesn't matter which one, but if we're coming from like the outside of the shin to the opposite, you know, up over top of the shoulder on the other side, we have to look at the spine, like how much is the spine position moving from the bottom to the top or the top to the bottom? Because really we shouldn't see any movement in that lumbar spine other than it's changing orientation, right? But there shouldn't be rotation. There shouldn't be flexion or extension in that. All my rotation should be coming from a pivot in my back foot my hip rotation and then my thoracic spine rotation right that's where all of my movement in a wood chopper should be coming from so that's the first thing i would look at is is what's actually moving in all those uh positions so how much spinal movement is there if the spine looks fine then i would look at okay when they're going and bringing that overhead you know do they actually have the range of motion to get overhead with that whatever load you're using it could even be a light load it doesn't matter right do they actually have the range of motion because if they don't then their body's going to seek that range of motion from somewhere else and so even though it might be absent from you know what we see there could be these micro changes in in position that cause then issues in that that lumbar spine as well and then the last one is i always like to talk about movement initiation right so where should movement actually be initiated from and a lot of the exercises that we perform if we call it a core exercise, we believe that the core should be what's driving the movement in that exercise. And I would argue, and actually I think a lot of the, the other leaders in the industry with regards to spine mechanics and spinal stability would, would actually argue that your power always comes from the hips. And in, in pretty much every single thing that you do, your power always comes from your hips. And so when you're doing a wood chopper, if you're driving from the spine thinking that I have to work my, you know, core because it's a core exercise, then you're actually missing the the point of that as well. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things to look at. There's a lot of things to think about with it. But I, I would even like get them onto the ground, try a, you know, a, a dead bug or something like that. See how much the spine moves in that. Try, you know, your bird dogs, your side planks, all those types of exercises and make sure that you clear the basic exercises before trying to add dynamic movement to those core exercises. So I actually remember at some points I want to talk that you mentioned before where it is so true in our in industry and in certifications that are out there to become a trainer because I'm an A certified and I don't recall too much talk about the spinal stability and all that they just mentioned. So it's so true. And once someone becomes a trainer, it's like not the end of the world. Like it's not the end road. There's so much to it. And as you can see, when I, even at the idea conference, there were so many trainers who, because of the different sessions, so much to learn. And the, when it comes from the hip and the spine um, stability, because even I had Pete Holman, he talks about organizing the spine and I had to explain to my client this morning, like, as you mentioned, like we have to focus on not just the rotation part, but really keeping the spine straight, for example, or the back. And, and that just to goes to show why it's really important for the trainers to keep learning. And another trainer that came on my show, Bilal Hafiz, he mentioned that if a trainer knows everything, that's when you need to run away from them because they don't know everything and there's a continuous process to it. So thank you yeah. for mentioning that point so then what are the three areas that should one focus to improve our spinal instability to work on spinal instability well one 
like I've already mentioned kind of the, the three big things is the first one is, is the mobility of the spine. So a lot of people see the spine as being, you know, we, well, we call it a spine. And so we see it as being this one thing that it's one joint that either flex or extends, right? Whereas really it's, it's you know, 33 individual vertebrae that should be able to move independently. And so I think the first thing is is understanding that we need to be able to separate pelvic motion from spine motion and then we need to be able to gain motion in, you know, not only the sagittal plane in flexion and extension, but also kind of some rotation and, you know, lateral flex like all these different movements. I need to be able to move in all those different directions but just not with a whole lot like a, with load on me, right? So I'm typically, you know, when I'm teaching this to clients, I'm working on that in a quadruped position. So typically on hands and knees, and then we'll slowly progress to standing, but there's never any load during that type of movement. So that's the first thing, because if you, if you go into a rehab clinic, a lot of people, they either move their spine way too much or they don't move it at all. And we need to be able to move it more. We just have to make sure that the movement is actually coming from the right place and that it's not all isolated in one joint because that's often what happens, right? So you'll see somebody will have maybe a, you know, L4, L5, you know, disc bulge, right? Or disc degeneration. And all that's saying to you is that they've been using that L4, L5 more than they've been using everything else. So everything else around that L4, L5 isn't moving the way it's supposed to. It isn't taking its share of the load. Whereas like your spine's really, really good at organizing, you know, everything and dispersing load equally if you allow it to and if you give it the ability to. So that's kind of where that stiffness versus, you know, stability comes in. You want the ability to stabilize the spine but not necessarily have areas of stiffness that don't end up moving and put extra pressure somewhere else. So that would be the first thing is actually working on mobility, which most people are like, whoa, I wanna work on stability, why am I moving? And it's just so you can make sure that everything's equally, like all, that, all those forces are equally dispersed along the spine. The next thing that I would suggest is then start working on the actual coordinated movements, right? So working on proper breathing mechanics, working on the proper coordinated and co-activation of all of the abdominal musculature and not believing the fallacy that, you know, we should train individual muscles like we do the rest of our body, right? We have the ability to do, you know, more specific quad work or hamstring work, calf work, biceps, triceps, pecs, back. We have the ability to kind of isolate or focus on these muscle groups. And so we try to translate that type of training to the core, but really it's a system and it needs to be working in a coordinated manner. And, you know, so if you're doing things like sit-ups or back extensions or lateral, you know, flexion or something like that, then you're only trying to emphasize one muscle over another and that's going to lead to that muscle perhaps overpowering something else. And so that's the next big thing is, is that coordinated co-activation of everything. And then the final thing for spinal stability is, is making that spinal stabilization system adaptable. Now, the adaptability is uh, as a tricky one because you have to have a good foundation of coordinated muscle activation and co-activation. You have to have good breathing mechanics all before you start doing this, these adaptability side of things. So like I would consider a wood chopper to be something that's working on adaptability because you're changing the pressure into the system as that load comes from the bottom to the top or the top to the bottom. Right. So your body's having to change how it's stabilizing throughout that. And so that's what we try to add a lot of. That's where actually we spend a lot of our time. You know, I ran a three hour session at idea on that. And we spent probably a good hour and a half of those three hours just on the adaptability side of things. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the spine and the spinal stabilization system adaptable to any position so that it doesn't matter 
what position my spine is in. Like I can bend over and reach for things. Like we got to know in, in life, I'm never in new, like I'm not in neutral spine a lot in life, spe specifically when I'm moving. And so I have to be able to create stability in all positions. I have to be able to adjust to changes in load or changes in force vectors from loads. You know, if I've got to reach into my trunk to pull something out and pick it up, or I've got to reach into a cupboard to grab something, I want to be able to not have pain in that. And that's what the adaptability side is. You know, so true. When I went to his session at IDEA, everything went so fast. And you guys, let me tell you, I did take his... Uh, lessons where we so he made us get in a dead bug position and we had to uh, our partners would have to like push our hand away from us and we have to resist the push and same thing with the legs and like opposite sides so like for example the right leg you push it away from away from you and then your client or your partner would have to push your hand away from you from the leg same thing with the opposite hand and a lot of my clients are feeling in their core they're like oh my gosh yes I feel like, so it looks easy, but it's, it's really good and it does get all of it activated. And as he mentioned, so the, again, just to summarize, the three areas are mobility, coordinated movement, and the back adaptability, which yeah. incorporates breathing. And before we move on, when it comes to stiffness, because I hear all the time, especially I teach also group fitness classes, people come in like, oh, I'm feeling so stiff today. So like, they stretch it out. It's really static stretching the way to go with stiffness. <laughs> Um, yeah. that's, that's a, that's a loaded question. Oh, sorry. Um, so let me you put it to you this way. No, no, we all, we all, we can discuss this. Come on. <laughs> um, so let me say this because I've got, I've gotten in, um, we'll call them heated conversations with people over stretching. Yes. Stretching has its place. So, you know, your, your typical, you know, 20, 30 second holds of a static position, it has its its time and its place, right? If if I feel stiff on a day and you know I'm I'm you know about to do like I'm going to the gym and I want to do some chest press and you know okay you can do a little bit of static stretching to kind of open up space. But what I think people are fooled on is thinking that static stretching is a way to gain more range of motion because it it doesn't help with that at all. What you're actually doing with that is you're just actually tricking your body into giving you the range that you already had. So your range of motion, so your flexibility is controlled by your stretch reflex. And so if you go into a stretch and you hold, let's say a, a pec stretch for, for 30 seconds, you'll realize that at the end, you'll feel like there's more space, but the tissues actually haven't lengthened what you've done is you've gone to that stretch reflex. Your body's responded by saying, okay, nope, this is as far as we're going to go. And then when you relax, your body's then like, oh, well, I didn't get injured in that range. Okay, I'll, I'll give you access to a little bit more of that range of motion. So if I'm using it solely to, you know, because I'm stiff on one day and I want to do a quick little stretch, like, I think that's fine. If you want to use it at the end of your workout in order to uh, try to minimize stiffness or minimize, you know, post-exercise soreness, then by all means, but just, but use it with the proper mindset when you go in. So yeah, I, I would, I'm, I'm a bigger fan of, you'll, you'll never be stiff if you, you move well and you move properly and you move often, right? So if you do those things, then you will be, you'll be fine because your body won't actually have a chance to get stiff. You won't have a chance to get tight, right? If I'm constantly moving, and I'm not saying lifting, I'm not saying go to the gym and just constantly be doing your squats and your deadlifts and your bench press and your pulls and that's moving. That's not moving. That's that's fitness. That's a, Those are two totally different concepts. So, but just move, right? Like move around. And at the end of the day, you know, you might feel tired. You might feel like, oh, like your joints are f starting to feel stiff, but that's just because they're starting to lose some hydration. You may be a little bit malnourished if you didn't eat. And then, you know, you got to make sure that you're obviously drinking water and, and moving properly. But that that's what I would say to that. So stretching in and of itself, that 30-second stretch isn't a bad thing if it's used for the right, right reason. 
I like how you said it's a heated question because it is in our industry because even at the idea conference last year in 2018, it was so funny because there's a, there's a different debate out there like when you should do static, whether before workout or after workout. And I'm on the side of like it more on like static stretching, particularly post workouts. But then one of those uh, sessions that I just spoke with this uh, speaker and she said, well, what if someone is in pain? Would you go into the workout right away? So like if some someone's like super tight, then yeah, I go with like the foam rolling first and then static stretching um, and then move into the workout. So any final thoughts on that before? Because I know it is a heated topic in our field. So yeah, I just think there's yeah, I just think there's misinformation out there. And there's there's a lot of those, right? There's a lot of the a lot a lot of things that have become what I once heard referred to as overuse injuries of knowledge where you hear something and you believe it because it was said by you know probably a reputable source that you didn't do any research on it but you hear this and then all of a sudden everything that you do or everything that you see then reinforces that and you have a really hard time changing your mind about it right so it becomes like this overuse injury of knowledge where like it's just like that's all it's just what, just what happens is what you believe right it's just recurring all the time so what i would say is this i'm a big fan of foam rolling for you know circulation that kind of stuff before a workout i'm actually okay with doing static stretching before a workout as well if you feel as though that's what what helps you there's a couple cautions i would have with that though is that one I would make sure that you progressively get into your movements afterwards. So don't just go right under a bar and start squatting 225 after doing some quad hamstring stretches because that range of motion that your body kind of took away from you and was protected by your stretch reflex will be in a relatively uncontrollable range of motion. So you have to slowly warm up and you have to demonstrate to your body that you have stability or the ability to control that range of motion before you start getting too far into your lifting. Yeah, most people will say don't do static stretching before because it reduces power output, but like, you know, the research on that was looking at max lifts and most people aren't doing max lifts and the changes in force output were minimal at best. So, it I don't think it actually plays all that big of a role if that's the reason why you're not doing it. But. That, that's so interesting. Actually, what I what I uh, understood and read is that it actually slows you down because I'm, I'm especially like as a runner, like I like to do a lot of cardio running and all that stuff. And so I was reading that it actually slows you down your progress. That's so why it's better to start with dynamic. But I mean, what you're saying is kind of similar in a sense that hey, guys, don't just go into the gym, do static stretching, and just jump straight into the weightlifting. He said to do movement first, which is kind of similar to dynamic stretch. Am I wrong or yeah. correct? No. Nope. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you, yeah. So movement, dynamic stretching, like, you know, I wouldn't, when I say movement, I'm not necessarily talking about dynamic stretching, but there could be a stretch component to it. I, I'm talking more about, you know, do like flowing movements in and out of positions. If you know what animal flow is, you know, those types of things, if you don't, you can look up animal flow or Mike Fitch and, and um, you'll see yeah. some of what I'm talking about, but that's more what I'm talking about. Like before I do my lifting, I don't do any static stretching. Um, I'll go through some of that animal flow and I feel that it really opens up, but you hit end range of tissues. And so therefore you get a bit of a dynamic stretch in there, right? But you're not actually, I'm not actually holding any of the positions. Right, because you see a lot of time I see it, guys at the gym, like they just go straight stretching or in the sauna to get their quote unquote warm up and then they go lifting. I'm like, no, you guys. But yes, thank you so much. Before we end off, so is kinetic performance movement education, is that only for fitness professionals or who is it? Can anyone sign up for it? Well, anybody can sign up for it. The core concepts course that we have, which focuses basically entirely on the spine and spinal stabilization system. I've had I've had everybody from, you know, personal trainers and strength and conditioning coaches to just like parents who have their kids in dryland training and want to maybe do something extra. I've had chiros and physios in it. I've had 
you know, people with back pain, because we talk so much about back pain and the desensitization of that back pain that they want to know, how do I handle this and what can I do at home? Right. So a lot of people want to want to help themselves as well, but it, it's, it's really open to anybody. There's no prerequisites for it. Our other course are appendicular concepts, which focuses on, well, outside of the spine, everything else. So hips, knees, ankles, and then, you know, thoracic spine, shoulder, and elbow. That's, I would probably say, is more for your personal trainer, strength and conditioning coach, allied health professional, because the language that we use in that is very scientific. It can be very scientific. So I would say that's kind of a caveat for that one. Awesome. And is there anything I should have asked, but I didn't? Or that you want to say one last thing? That you should have asked, but didn't. Well, you didn't ask me about asymmetrical loading. Oh my gosh, you're right. Oh my gosh. So thank God that you mentioned this. Before we get into how and why it's important, can you tell us what is asymmetrical loading first? So asymmetrical loading is just the idea that you're loading one side disproportionately to the other. So it doesn't have to mean that I'm only loading one side, but that I am loading loading the two sides disproportionately basically. Yeah. And so why so how how and why is it important for us to add it into our workouts? So if you look at traditional exercise or traditional movement, most of what you see in the gym is bilaterally loaded right? You either have a barbell or you have a two dumbbells or two kettlebells, something like that, that is connecting the two sides of your body or allowing you to be balanced on both sides. But most of what we do outside of the gym, whether it be in life, occupations or sport are unilateral activities. And so being able to train that way, I actually find to be more specific to the variability of what our life's our life is right so our life activities are very variable we're, we're never doing the same thing twice even though we might think we are and so being able to train in that way is is very helpful um, but it actually stemmed from rehab because one of the ways that we rehab you know gen general population athletes is actually through loading one side to allow it to express its own strength without relying on the opposite side to kind of chime in with its strength or overpower that weakened side. So we use that to kind of strengthen up the weaker side, but I love to use it. Like I use it all the time in my training with my clients, my athletes, because I just, I just think it's a a smarter way to train and if you know we just finished talking all about spinal stability and core strength and if you unilaterally load anything so just have load in one side of your body while you're doing a chest press or a row you're going to have some sort of core activation that's higher than what you would if it was both sides loaded right so you get kind of a you know bigger bang for your buck more muscle activation from it I agree because even in my boot camp class, I, I do it with my clients as well, but in my boot camp class, because I have a lot of older population that attend, and so I, I've done that, and it does really help because you're, you're trying to focus on that one muscle, but then also you're trying to stay stable, and then you activate the core, all of it together, so I highly recommend it as well. As you guys can tell, there's so much that you can talk about, and this is why I completely forgot about that question, so <laughs> thank you so much, Adam. Where can we find you or and stay in contact with you so best way is probably on social media so instagram facebook twitter the tag is just at kinetic prfm and that's on all the social media platforms you can also visit our website at www.kineticperformance.ca and yeah they can contact me there and i respond to everybody so if you you know send me a message i'll get back to you so everyone, you can find him on, on Instagram at where, Adam? Kinetic PRFM. And you guys can find the show notes and I'll tag him along. Thank you so much, Adam. And I hope you have a great day. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for tuning in. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe today and leave a five-star review. 
You can also screenshot and share this episode with a family or a friend. Be strong, be fit, be fit for akhirah. Oh,